please welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, William S. Silver. This is a talk about economic value. And in keeping with the theme of today's conference, it's specifically a talk about creating more economic value. Now, I'm the dean of the business school at Sonoma State University, and for over two decades, I've been working with companies, doing research, and teaching students how to create more economic value. But the most important lessons that I learned about creating economic value, I learned from my dad, working at Silver's Drug Shop, a retail pharmacy in a small New England town. And today, the day before Father's Day, in the year 2013, I want to honor my dad by sharing with you the lessons that he taught me. So we need to start with a common understanding of what we mean by economic value. And before you go to sleep, and much to the chagrin of my colleagues at Sonoma State University in the Department of Economics, I'm going to do this without a single graph, and I'm not going to make you solve a differential equation. Instead, I want to share a story, a fable or parable, if you will, about something with which you're all familiar, an agricultural product we call coffee. Now, economic value occurs when two people or two parties enter, enter into an exchange in which each has something that the other wants or perhaps needs. Let's say you wake up this morning, and what you want or need is a piping hot cup of black liquid that's a little bitter but oh so tasty to get you awake in the morning. If I can meet that need, we can create economic value. If I can grow beans, harvest them, roast them, grind them, distribute them, and package them. This is my kicking horse coffee. You can buy this, and we have created economic value. I have given you something that you want, and you have paid me in return. But there are those mornings when it is just not in the cards for you to make your own cup of coffee. <clears throat> Got to get the kids off to school, or maybe you have a business meeting. In Sonoma County, many business days start with breakfast at Max Deli, or Jeffrey's Hillside, Hank's Creekside, or Dirk's Parkside Cafe. <laughs> I think I've got them all. And whether you get Eggs Benedict, or oatmeal and a bowl of fruit, you can have someone pour you and serve you a cup of coffee. But you're gonna pay just a little bit more for that. You see, this cup of coffee here costs a couple cents. This is gonna cost you a couple dollars. But it's worth it because you have gotten more. And so we could end our story there with a simple economic lesson that if I can provide you more goods and more services, you will pay me more and we will create more economic value. But our story does not end there. Like many good stories, this one has a twist. And like many fables, this twist involves a giant. And we're going to call that giant Starbucks. <laughs> now, you're going to have to decide whether it's an evil giant or a good giant. <laughs> How many people have been to Starbucks recently? Show of hands? A few of you. I'm guessing that you spent more than a couple cents or even more than a couple dollars. What did you spend? Five dollars? Ten dollars? Maybe twenty or more? It's been calculated that were you to skip one Starbucks run per week while your kids are in K through 12 education and invest that money instead, you can earn enough to pay for their college tuition. <laughs> Why? Why do we pay more for Starbucks? Is it their superior service and their superior product? Many people don't think so. What Starbucks does is create an emotional resonance with their customers. We have a name for it, right? It's the Starbucks run. They make you feel good about going to Starbucks. Let's explore this experience. It starts even before you show up at Starbucks, in that on any street corner, in every city, in every country in the world, you can find a Starbucks. Now, of course, I'm exaggerating, but only slightly. If you were to pull out your iPhone right now, go to the App Store, and put in Starbucks Locator, you will find 21 apps to help you find a Starbucks. And when you show up at Starbucks and walk through the door, you can't even get a, coffee, a cup of coffee, because first, you gotta wait in line. 
but the line is part of the experience. You see, the line indicates that other people want to be here. And so you are part of the in crowd. We call it positive crowd sign. And it's not a passive experience, it's an active experience. As you're in line, you'll walk by the newspapers. Do you look at the headlines and reflect upon what's happening in the world during the day? Do you look at the knickknacks on the shelf and consider buying a gift for someone? Or perhaps you're going to buy that coffee maker and save yourself all the money that you're giving to Starbucks. And then there's the pastry case. Now, if you look in that pastry case, you will see something that's a blueberry muffin. Do you try and convince yourself that this is healthy because it's got blueberries and blueberries are fruit and fruit is good for you? Do not kid yourself, that is a cupcake in disguise. But whether you get the muffin or not, you're going to feel good about yourself. Did you get that muffin? Congratulations, you've indulged and you deserve it. And did you skip the muffin and get a bowl of fruit and said, congratulations, you made a healthy choice for the day. And ironically, when you show up at the counter, you can't even order a cup of coffee. They won't know what you're asking for. <laughs> the closest you can come, perhaps, is to order a tall black. But you're likely going to order something of the order on a grande non-fat extra hot latte. Hold the phone, please. And the person that serves you isn't a mere waiter or waitress or server or clerk. This person is a barista, right. <laughs> And there's the magic, the final magic of the Starbucks experience. They have transported you from your location to a street side Italian cafe. <laughs> and you will pay more for that experience. They have created an emotional resonance. They help you feel good about yourself. The Starbucks run, if you make one, is a positive part of your day. And more economic value is created because you paid more for that. And we could end our story there but I learned something else from my dad, working at Silver's Drug Shop. You see, long before there was Starbucks, there was Silver's Drug Shop. Since 1919, in a small New England town called West Haven, Connecticut. And this was the community center of that town. Think green with a church on it, and across from that is Silver's Drug Shop. Pharmacy, soda fountain, front store where you buy cards and candy. And I would be there, behind the soda fountain, and people would come in, they wouldn't order a frappuccino, they would order a malted, or a fizzy, or a root beer float, or perhaps even just a cup of coffee. And was I a barista? No. I know some of you are old enough to remember this. What was I? I was a jerk, right. <laughs> it is the rare person that gets up in front of a room and asks the audience to call him a jerk. I was a soda jerk. It's on my resume. I was proud of it. And I would sit there, and I would gaze across the pharmacy, and I would see the way my dad worked with the customers. And what he taught me was that every single customer needs to be treated as if they were part of your family. They have done us the honor of bringing us their business. And so when Mrs. Johnson walked up to the pharmacy, my dad would say, hello, Mrs. Johnson. How are you doing today? How are you feeling? And he meant the question. And if you ask Mrs. Johnson how she's feeling, she will tell you in no small amount of detail. <laughs> and he would listen with compassion and caring. And sometimes he would have advice, and sometimes he would have something else to sell her, and sometimes he was just a friendly ear to listen to. But Mrs. Johnson felt good about her trip to Silver's Drug Shop because she knew there was one place in the world where people cared about her and where people wanted to listen to her and to help her. And for that, we charged just a little bit more. We couldn't compete with the Walgreens of the world on price, but we competed by caring for our customers. But this left me puzzled because at 78 years young of age, my dad is still working in a pharmacy. And Mrs. Johnson is still coming in, and she must be about 125 years old now. <laughs> and he is still listening to her. And he is still treating her with compassion. And he is still treating her with care. And I wonder why. It's not about the mere exchange of dollars anymore. He doesn't need the money. In fact, he gives most of it away. So there must be something else. And what I realized is that my dad does this 
because when he treats people this way, they give him something back in return. See, in West Haven, Connecticut, my dad is Mr. Silver. He commands respect, admiration. People appreciate what he's done, and he knows that he has made a difference in the world. And that exchange has the most economic value because the exchange of compassion and caring for respect and for making a difference is priceless. Happy Father's Day, Dad. I love you. Thank you for everything you've taught me, and thank you for listening to my talk.